We had the dog tags all along by Sandy Nieto. For 35 years, this question haunted me. Where in the world is my father? Here's what I knew. My father's name was Leo Thomas Bowden. He was a World War II veteran. He had worked in the U.S. Grand Hotel in downtown San Diego as a chef. He was a drinker. We had lived as a family in a tiny house in Linda Vista. I had two older sisters. We were a regular family. Then, one sunny day in July of 1954, when I was just two and a half, he just up and left. With no warning or explanation, he disappeared from our lives. One morning he was drinking coffee at the kitchen table and the next he was gone, a ghost. I clung to one wisp of a memory. I was a toddler playing outside of our tiny house. I twirled on the poles that held up our porch. <coughs> Mommy was inside cooking a big Sunday dinner and the smells of lemon chicken and cinnamon apple pie wafted on the breeze. The clouds hung low in the sky Daddy sat on a chair on the porch and he smoked a cigarette. Don't do that, you'll fall. <coughs> I don't know if it was said with love or annoyance. The only other real memory that I had was a story of, of my relationship that came from my sister Linda. Daddy would take care of you in the evenings to give Mommy a break. She'd be hurrying around the house and he would balance you on his lap reading the evening news. That was it. One fuzzy memory on a porch and family lore that he once cared enough to hold me. With the absence of answers, I tried to fill in the blanks. I couldn't put a name to the feeling, but somehow I knew that I was responsible for his disappearance. He left soon after I was born. He already had two daughters, so why would he want me, another girl? It was my fault. I was not born a boy. I was responsible for his disappearance. <laughs> On some days, I became obsessed with finding answers about what happened to Daddy. Maybe he got so drunk that he fell in the street, got amnesia, and doesn't know who he is. Maybe he was kidnapped. Maybe he owes bad men money and is in jail in Tijuana. Then other days, like the day he wasn't there to take me to the father-daughter dance, I found myself living in this magical world where I could see the whole movie play out. He would ride up on his white horse and rescue us, rescue me. The not knowing why he left, or where he was, formed a crater-like void. I never knew what hurt worse. Carrying the shame of having a father who would just leave you, or missing a father who you never knew at all. What does your daddy do? Where is your dad? Why is your dad never in church? I learned it was easier just to say, he's dead. <laughs> Mom wore a similar cloak of fear and shame. She carried her secrets alone until I was in high school and she took out two brown boxes that held my father's documents and photos from the war. As we looked over my father's memories, mother confessed, honey, I'm so sorry, but the truth is I was never married to your father, Leo. Your sisters and you were born out of wedlock. My heart skipped a beat. It was another piece of the puzzle of my life, and yet it didn't provide any answers as to why Dad left or where he was. <coughs> as the years passed, I learned to put on the mask of the entertaining, always happy mascot. If anyone looked deeper, they would have seen a hollow shell of a young woman. Until a few sprinkles of miracles entered my life. I fell in love with Manuel, my co-worker, a handsome Colombian at the town and country hotel, reserved but hilarious, faithful. A year later we were married. After seven years of traveling and adventures, we started our family, each a gift that brought me true joy. At 36, my mother died, and I became the keeper of my father's brown boxes. Once again, I glanced over the medals of service, the dog tags, and the military ID numbers. 
Then I tucked that box away in a closet. Until the summer of 1988. Six months after my mother's death. All was well in my world, but the question still haunted me. Maybe I'm not an orphan. What if I found him now? Maybe if he could meet his grandchildren, if he saw us, the love would come rushing back. I had to take a chance. So early one morning, I called the VA with my father's ID number. Ma'am, I see three aliases with that ID number. <laughs> What? Dad went by three names? Yes, I have the name you provided as your father, Leo Thomas Bowden, but he also went by two other names. What does that mean? It was then that the officer on the phone gave me the news that I had been waiting for my whole life. Well, ma'am, our records do show his date of death as July 27, 1962, in Cook County, Illinois. My body froze. My mind went numb. Date of death? July of 1962? Date of death? Daddy was gone. You know, if you can request his death certificate from the county, we can send you all his records. Good luck. As soon as I hung up the phone, I burst into tears. He died when I was 10? All that wasted time dreaming of his return when he'd been dead for most of my life. It was the end of all my magical thinking, but not the end of my curiosity. As I cooked dinner, I thought, what about those aliases? As I brought my daughter to dance class, I mused, who was he if he wasn't Leo Thomas Bowden? I thought on Sondheim's <coughs> lyrics from Into the Woods, sometimes people leave you. Halfway through the woods. When I received all of my father's records from the government, I found a treasure trove of clues and a map that led to even more mysteries. First, there was his rap sheet from the FBI with his drunken disorderly conduct on three different dates. Second, there was a letter from an attorney that represented his two sons in search of military insurance. Sons. He had two sons. Were they born before or after my sisters and me? My head was spinning. Third was a letter from his former wife. Was that why he didn't marry mom? Each document led me further and further down a rabbit hole. I became driven, almost as if addicted to a drug to discover more. At times I was half present in life and half mired in the unanswered questions of the past. I researched all I could about my brothers. Before I knew it, I was on the phone with a Mrs. George Menig, my aunt by marriage. <coughs> Mrs. Menig, you don't know me, but my name is Sandy Nieto, maiden name Bowden. She seemed nice, open to talking. I continued. <coughs> I think your husband was my father's brother who left my family in San Diego in the summer of 1954. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> the tone of her voice was warm. A small town woman who was opening her arms and her stories to me. Your father was the prodigal son that returned to his parents in July of 1954, she said. Wait, Leo told my mom that he was an orphan. No, I have a photo of your grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary with Leonard and his third wife. He had three wives. The story unfolded. Leo married his first wife, Dolores, when he, they were very young. They were married in a Catholic church and had three boys. I had more half-brothers. <laughs> he wanted to get away from her, but divorce was out of the question. So, on the evening of December 5th, 1939, Leo and Dolores went out to dinner with another couple. During dinner, Leonard excused himself possibly to use the restroom and never returned. <laughs> he called for a taxi and drove to the South Shore. He got out of the cab, walked to the water where he apparently tossed his hat and identification into the lake to make it look like a drowning or a suicide, then got back into the taxi and left for good. Before he even met my mother and me, my father had staged his own death. <laughs> of all his mysteries, this was the one I was not expecting. Explain 
changed so much. Why he didn't marry my mother. Why he could just leave our family without a word. He'd done it before. I hung up the phone. My father was the kind of man who would fake his own death to escape his first family. Three years later, I watched my oldest daughter attend the father-daughter dance at school with my husband. And later that night, as I did our ni nightly dancing routine, I felt a shift happening within. I put on a Barbra Streisand album and held my kids dancing with them, rocking them to sleep. In the magic of that night, it was clear. There was no savior on a white horse coming. There was no document or phone call that would make it all make sense or make my father a good man. The hole in my heart would have to be filled by me. As my children fell into a blissful sleep, I sighed. For the first time, I felt the weight of the past lifting off of my heart like a cloud, and I knew two things my father would never know. The joy of a family I would treasure forever, and the joy of knowing myself and the wise woman I was becoming. Sandy, you just saw your piece performed for the first time. How do you feel? Uh, I have gratitude. I feel blessed. I feel like a baby. My story is a baby story. Everybody used much bigger words in their story, but my story is real, just as everyone else is. I feel very blessed. I do. That you picked me. Lee, this is the second time you've done Showcase. It's such a different piece for you. How did it feel to be doing such a kind of mystery piece? Yeah, it's always fun to sort of like take on different um, different stories and just try and like get into the like you know sort of the mind and the world of a person who isn't yourself. Um, so I guess it's always just sort of a process of just like uncovering and, and finding the ways in which your own self might fit into somebody else's story. And how does it feel knowing that the author is in the audience when you perform? <laughs> Um, gosh, she's I, an actress, she no. just delivered the line. I guess it is a little bit more nerve-wracking just because it's like, you know, I have to say the words right, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, you, you, you want to, like, you know, you really want to do justice to the things that were said and, and, you know, and try and present it in a way that seems as authentic as the way that they wrote it. So there's a little bit more just sort of, like, keenness in that way. Sandy, what would you say to new writers that are thinking of churning into the showcase? What should, what would you tell them? What would the advice to a new writer be? Um, be brave and courageous and just step out and do it. You know, this is my first year, so I, I feel like a newbie and a baby, and, and I would encourage anybody to do that. I just want to say, uh, Dr. Egar, she did her memoir at 90 years old, so I have some time. Just a little bit, but a little bit of time to finish the memoir. So. Thank you, Dr.